Hi class. Um, today we're going to start talking about how science is a different way of knowing. Uh, there's a reason why you're going to believe the Journal of the American Medical Association about some disease or condition versus the Inquirer, which is something you're going to look at as you're going to check out in the grocery store. And so science is based on repeated practice, experimentation, research, and peer review. So there is a process behind how science is a way of knowing things versus us just believing it. So um, scientists start by asking questions. And so scientific inquiry, inquiry is another way to describe how science is a different way of, of knowing. So you'll see it both ways. You'll hear you'll NOS and you'll hear inquiry. Inquiry is just asking questions, trying to figure out things. And if you're a fan of the Big Bang, bang Theory, I have put in a short clip on Edpuzzle for you to watch, and it's where Sheldon is talking about the scientific method. Next, you're going to watch um, a short video on the scientific method on Edpuzzle, and you can see on the right of the screen there are your guided notes that go along with it. So as you watch the video, fill in those guided notes as you go. Um, the scientific method and the nature of science is usually a question on almost all standardized tests that are going to be testing you on science. And so after you finish the video, you'll be here. And on the left of the screen is a concept map that you're going to be filling out as you go through the slides. And then there's some questions to answer also. So um, I would fill in the part that the slide's on and then look and see if there's any questions on that part. So here we go. We're going to dive right in. These um, pictures come from Cornell Doodle Notes. And so we're going to um, be looking at the question, what are the components of a fair and controlled experiment? Um, for this PowerPoint, we're only going to be looking at what is the scientific method. As we continue in this lesson in Unit 0, um, we'll look at variables, and then we'll be looking at some more of the Cornell, Cornell Doodle Notes. So I think we're doing questions one, um, 1 and 6, maybe? Anyway, we're going to find out. So what is a testable question? Um, there's this big debate always going on between science and religion, and they both can exist together. It's just that they're a different way of knowing things. So science is based on experimentation, research, and peer review. Um, religion is based on faith. Both exist. Both have helped us gain knowledge. And science isn't trying to tell you that religion doesn't exist. So please know that that is not um, what we're trying to do in your science class. Only thing we're going to talk about here, though, is science and the nature of science. So for something to be a science question, it has to be what's called falsifiable. And what that means is that we have to be able to prove it false. And so if you read here on the slide, it says that science is driven by questions about natural phenomena and the way things work and behave. Questions come in two basic forms. And so in science, we look at testable questions. In our next lesson, you're going to learn about variables in science or a coming up lesson. And variables are the things that you're going to change in the experiment. And so, for example, I love Dr. Pepper. I love Starbucks. And so I could do an experiment um, with some plants to test whether or not my plants will grow better if I give them Starbucks. And so I would be changing giving my plants Starbucks versus the normal stuff. And so then we are going to watch the responding variable. So the thing that I change is called the manipulated um, or the independent variable. 
and that would be adding Starbucks to my plants. And then you have the responding variable or the dependent variable, which is dependent on what you change. And that would be um, measuring whether or not my plants grew or not. So in your notes, you have some spaces um, to fill in some of these questions. Um, you have example questions down there at the bottom of the slide and in your guided notes. And so I think for mine, I put, how does purple light affect fluorescent paint. So if you've ever used a UV light, you know that the ultraviolet radiation light that we can't see um, makes things that are fluorescent glow. And so would purple light do the same? Purple light is in the visible spectrum. It has less energy than ultraviolet light. And so I would be testing my independent variable of purple light and my dependent variable would be whether or not things would glow. So those are some um, blanks to help you um, test those kind of questions. Um, some other things I put down, well changing the amount of sunlight cause increased plant growth. Will students' grades increase or decrease if the amount, based on the amount of sleep they get, is changed? If the amount of coffee is increased or decreased, will that have an effect on Dr. J's amount of smiling? So just some examples, some things that we can test. And then there's untestable questions. And these really aren't scientific questions. Um, so we have to be a little more specific. And so your notes ask you to change the question, why do blackberry bushes have thorns? Well, that's kind of a broad question. Um, well, there could be many reasons and then we're going to be looking at like several reasons and so we need to kind of change this question to be a little more specific so the example they give you here on this slide is changing that question to say how do the number of thorns affect how many animals eat from a blackberry bush so there we're um, counting the number of thorns, and then based on the number of thorns, does that affect the animals? And so the independent um, or manipulated variable would be number of thorns, and the responding variable or um, dependent variable would be the black bear, um, animals eating the blackberry bush. I changed it to say, um, how are the number of thorns a blackberry bush have affect how humans how how many humans harvest blackberries so again you have to be able to test something along with testing um you have accuracy and precision knowing the difference between these two is going to be very important and these two words are going to come up again when we talk about variables so accuracy is how close to the true value you are and so if I knew that I had an object that 5,000 people measured and we came up with the accepted value, value that it weighed 10 grams. And if we measured it in class, if everyone in class got 10 grams, everyone had high accuracy. But let's say that one person measured it at 9.6, one person measured it at 10.2, um, another person measured it at 8. Um, how accurate are those measurements? How close are they to that 10 gram value? Next is precision. And precision is all those measurements, how close are they together? So if I use a triple beam balance, to, to measure that 10 grams. And um, 
I put on the, the mass on the triple beam ba balance and I measured 10.1. Um, and we know that to be accurate, it would have to say 10 grams. Well, if Susie, um, a student in my class, took that same triple beam balance and measured the mass again, if the machine is precise, it's going to measure 10.1 again. If it measures a different value, then the machine isn't very precise. And then if Johnny takes that same triple beam balance and measures the mass and he gets 10.1, that means that my machine is measuring very precise. So precise means with repeated measurements, we get the same thing. And accuracy means how close to the real accepted value are we. Okay, now we're going to move into, <clears throat> sorry, what is the scientific method? The scientific method has been taught as first you start with the hypotheses and then you do the research and then na, 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 na. that's not how science really works. That's not how the scientific method really occurs. If a person can start with a hypothesis, do some research, and then decide that their hypothesis is, needs some work, and so they might go back to forming their hypothesis. They might form their hypothesis, um, do some research, do the experimentation, look at their data, and decide that they could have done their experiment a little bit better. And maybe they go back to square one and start asking the question again. Um, they could get all the way to peer, view, peer review and during a conference where they're presenting their information or um, they submitted their paper to a journal, they get feedback back and they decide to go back to the research and, and then start their experiment, exper experimentation again, sorry. And so the scientific method is really, you know, this continuum of testing, asking questions, researching, um, reevaluating, re experimenting. So it doesn't go in a line. Uh, we learned it as a line. You do the hypothesis, then you do the research, and then you. Do. That's not how it happens. Um, it's a continuum. Now we get to it. Do we do get to an end result and where we are looking at the data and making conclusions? But even then, we're not at the end. Then we have to do peer review, and from that peer review, we might have to go back and look at our hypothesis or our research or our, our experimental design. And so it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And and I learned what are the seven steps of the scientific method, and it really doesn't go straight in a line. So we make observations. We make observations using our five senses. So we can see things, we can hear things, we can touch things. We we're not going to really taste things. <laughs> we're not going to be drinking acid and say, oh, it's an acid or um, drinking a base. We're not going to we're not going to do that. But I could taste something and taste whether it was sweet or sour. Um, so we're going to use our five senses and we can also use scientific tools. So we might use a ruler. We might use a triple beam balance. We might use a computer to help us take measurements, but we're still using our observations. Most science starts with a question. Um, why are daffodils yellow? Um, why is baby Yoda called the kid? I don't know. I'm just coming up with some things. And so starting with questions, then we have to do the next step. which is to do some research. You don't want to do, you know, an experiment for 10 years, look, analyze all your data, what takes you another year, and then write a paper, and then you go to peer review, and you're presenting all your new information, and someone goes, um, that was done in 1950 by um, Snyder and Holt. Maybe you should check that. <laughs> so you want to do your research. You want to try to find out as much as you can about your topic. Um, that way you can find out what we already know. So you're not reinventing the wheel. You're not um, doing an experiment that, you know, we already know stuff about. And it also helps inform you on developing your plan and what are you going to test and how you are going to test it. 
So next you're gonna sit down and come up with a plan. Um, you're gonna sit and decide how, what are you gonna test exactly? What are you gonna change? What are you gonna measure? What lab equipment are you gonna need? Um, do, are you gonna need to talk to any other scientists or, or other people to find out how they did this? Are you repeating someone else's um, work and could you collaborate with them? So you're gonna sit down and kind of come up with a game plan. And then once you've done that, you're going to come up with a hypothesis. And that's where you're going to have those if-then statements. So um, if what is the effect of purple light on fluorescent paint? And so I'm going to have to decide in my planning stage, if that's my question, what kind of paint I'm going to use, what kind of purple light am I going to use? Um, you know, GE purple lights, or I'm going to use um, LG purple lights. Am I going to use fluorescent lights? Am I going to use, you know, you decide what kind of purple light and then how are you going to test it? Um, what kind of paint are you going to use? Um, are you going to use um, glow in the dark plastic stuff? So you got to come up with what you're testing and then um, you go to your question and that is, Will per, how does purple light affect um, fluorescent paint? And then you come up with an experiment. And that's where, you know, what lab equipment do you need? How are you going to test it? How are you going to measure it? Measure um, it. What collecting, how are you going to collect the data? How are you going to reduce error? And all those other good things. So then you collect the data. So you run the experiment. You need to keep your data organized. Um, I keep saying um, I say um a lot. You want to keep it organized in graphs and tables. And nowadays that we have technology, we can use Excel spreadsheets and create graphs. Um, there I go with them again. Stop it. Meep. And so collecting data is important. It needs to be, um, <laughs> it needs to be neat. And then from that, you can make um, charts and tables to help show trends in your data. So did purple light make the fluorescent paint glow and to what effect? Oh, oh, oh. And then you're going to draw conclusions. Um, my experiment supported the conclusion that purple light will make fluorescent paint glow. It probably won't. It depends on if there's a little bit of UV stuck in that light bulb also. And based on my data, and then I refer back to my data, bloody by bloody, see chart two, um, to support my statement. And then I'll wrap up my experiment. And so I might be at this point and decide that, oh, you know what? I need to go back and redo part of my experiment. I did not um, account for this source of error. And then you report your data. You write a paper, you go to a presentation. In science, usually, um, <laughs> Usually you send your, your work, you write a paper and you send it off to a journal of your peers. So for example, if I'm a chemist, I'm going to write my paper and send it to a chemistry organization um, <laughs> for them to review and they'll send me back edits. And the big thing there would be have them publish my article. That's a big deal in science to have your work published. You might go to a conference and present your work where you have um, your peers in your audience and they can give you feedback also. So sharing your work, having given, giving feedback, getting feedback um, is very important to the scientific process. So you have to communicate your re results by peer review. If that chemist um, sent their paper to an ecologist, a, an ecology um, group to get their paper published, then they're not really their peers. Biologists will know chemistry, but you, if you're doing straight chemistry, you want to have straight chemi chemists looking at your work. And so 
you have your graphic organizer to help you um, break down um, the scientific method. And so hopefully you were filling that out as we went along. And that's the end of the scientific method. Just remember that it's not just me walking into the classroom and saying, if you drink Dr. Pepper, your grades will go up. Or if you eat a piece of chocolate before you go to bed, you'll be smarter. Um, science is based on repeated trials, um, peer review, research. It's not just someone walking in and say, I believe this, therefore it's true. That's it, folks. Hope you learned something. Hope you filled out your guided notes. And look forward to seeing you at the next one.